Hey, everybody. I am so glad to be back. I'm Dana Brownlee. I am a workplace anti-racism trainer and speaker. And today I have Vanessa Kirkpatrick. Hey, Vanessa. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for, for joining. For those of you who didn't see the first episode, Vanessa, um, you know, we're here, we discuss the undiscussable. So I'm going to, you know, bring it. V uh, Vanessa is a white mom who was in Utah, but now has relocated to, to Berkeley, California. So that's kind of a big, big jump there. But she's a white mom who wrote to me after a couple of my articles that I wrote in Forbes um, that were Dear White People. It was after George Floyd and Amy Cooper. And it was me advising, I guess, in a sense, um, some things that white people can do to advance anti-racism where they work and live. And so she wrote to me um, in a very thoughtful, nuanced way. Um, I was really blown away by her words. And so since then, we've kind of become friends. And she was my inaugural guest. And she's really the impetus behind my doing this show is that I wanted to bring a forum. I wanted to create a forum where I feel like we can kind of get out of our racial silos to an extent and talk and just be more open and honest about things we like, things we don't like, questions we always wanted to ask, frustrations we might have. So that's what I'm trying to do here twice a month. So I hope that you'll join us. And please send comments in. We're going to, to check the comments throughout. I know I did a bad job of that last time, but I'm old. So I'm just kind of getting with the technology. So with this, today our focus is a big one, okay? Today our focus is what I feel is a really, really bedrock issue that's a problem in terms of a disconnect between um, a lot of people of all races and ethnic backgrounds in terms of on this anti-racism journey. And that is the word racist. What does racist mean in 2021? Okay. And before I even get into that, I need to back up because I know we're already starting to get defensive. As soon as you see the word racist, I promise you, you probably start getting defensive. So I want to lay a little bit of context. And I think that Vanessa is in agreement with me on this and how important this is to, to lay this context. When we talk about the word racist, for one thing, I'm not advocating that you label anybody racist. Okay, That's probably just not a way to win friends and be influential with them. It just, you know, we don't like labels. I don't like being labeled. On the last episode, I talked about how I took the the, I, the implicit association test, the IAT online, and it showed that I do have programming or I do have a preference for European American or for white. And, and there are lots of reasons for that. And we're going to talk about that. I'm going to share with you some examples of when I feel like maybe I was racist. Um, so while I acknowledge that, do I want somebody calling me up, calling me racist? No, I don't want that any more than I want them calling me jealous. I'm sure at times I'm jealous or selfish or short tempered. I'm sure I could be a lot of things. But do I want that label hurled at me? Probably not. Not so much. So. I just want to put that out there because I don't want people to misunderstand. I think that sometimes when we have this conversation around the word racist, it's because people think that we want the ability to call people racist. And that could not be further from the truth. The LinkedIn learning course that I have coming out, in fact, I talk about that and I say, you know, avoid labels. People just don't like labels. So, um, so that's not the goal. The goal is not to go around and call people racist, but the goal is to understand the universe of what is considered racist. Because if some people are viewing all of this, let's say there's a long continuum here, all of this is considered racist, maybe to some people. But if other people are saying, oh, well, only this much, only if you're beating somebody over the head or only if you're hurling the N-word or only if you've got your knee on their neck, that's racist or I've got a hood in the closet, or I'm stringing people up on the weekends. That's racist. But other than that, you know, everything's okay. So that's the problem is if you're only seeing this much as racist, but I'm seeing this much as racist, we're missing the bulk of the racist behavior. And therefore we can't work on it. We can't improve it. 
I would argue this is one of the reasons why we've made so little progress in the past 30, 40 years on this topic is because we have this old school myopic view of racist as like, you know, Bull Connor or Archie Bunker or just something that's really, really extreme that is completely anachronistic that does probably exist somewhere, but is very, very rare. So that's not the main problem. Honestly, the main problem is this other subtle racism that is much harder to see and much harder to call out. So that's what we really want to get to today. So with that preamble, I hope that that was helpful in terms of, you know, set in the context. The goal is not to label people racist and, and all of that. That's not really the goal. But the goal is to open our mind so that maybe we're seeing it more broadly so that when that behavior comes up, we can call it out. Or maybe even within ourselves, we can see how maybe something that we said or we did might be offensive to other people. So with that, I want to get to Vanessa because I really want to make sure this is highly interactive. So Vanessa, let's start with you. And I really kind of want you to start wherever you want. So I'm just going to throw out the softball question. When we talk about this topic, what is front of mind for you? Or what are some of the things that maybe you think that people might feel, but they might not want to say? I mean, going back to what you were just saying about, you know, getting more familiar with the nuances of what racism means in 2021. I think that that has broadened um, last year in particular, and there's more people talking about it in more detailed ways, and that's a good thing. But I also think that, um, you know, there's this threat of cancellation, this risk of being labeled a racist if you come out and say, you know, any little thing that you might be thinking that we all think doesn't matter what color you are, like you have thoughts about, you know, other people, it's part of our implicit bias, it's part of navigating our world. And when there's such a taboo around having those conversations, um, they just go underground yeah. and they'll inform your opinion and the way you treat other people and the way you go about the world. So for me, I feel like that's a huge block, especially among white liberal progressives is you're not allowed to say like, you know, I'm I'm down with BLM, but I still don't get why we capitalize the word black, but not white. And that's a scenario I brought up to you that I hear a lot from people where it's like, I don't think I'm racist, but I have these questions in my head and I don't really have a safe place to talk about them. So I keep it to myself. And I think that's that needs to shift. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm feverishly looking for a pen because you you <laughs> you mentioned so many things that I want to unpack. I don't I don't want to forget anything. So let me launch in. Okay, okay. so um, I completely hear where you're coming from. So let's talk about that word. Um, and let I want to offer something that Kendi talks about mm -hmm. in some of his books, and it might shift your thinking. What he said was people think of the word racist is like a scarlet letter, like mm -hmm. a label that once you're labeled racist, you're racist. Like you're and, and again, Robin D'Angelo, spoiler alert, Vanessa told me before we got on that she's got a beef with Robin D'Angelo. So we're going to talk about that later. OK, so all of y'all have a beef with Robin D'Angelo. We're going to unpack that. Um, so let me know in the comments uh, if you do. So. It's so they think of it as kind of like a scarlet letter, like, oh, you're racist. And Robin D'Angelo talks about the good, bad binary. So it's like the racists are the bad people, but we want to be the good people. So you can't be racist and be a good person. So, of course, as soon as you hear that word, you have to put all your energy into convincing the other person that you're not racist. Mm -hmm. um, but what what Kendi says, which makes so much sense to me, and I really want to just implore you guys to think about it, just at least consider it is we're not necessarily label, you know, we're not la trying to label somebody racist, but we're calling out, did you have a racist moment? Mm -hmm. And what he says, for those of you who haven't read um, How to Be an Anti-Racist or Stamped, he calls himself out all the time. He was like, oh, I was doing this. And, you know, that was pretty racist. <laughs> so he was calling out his behavior in that moment. 
And that is a big difference. That's why I sent out the, the meme on LinkedIn the other day, you know, stop asking, are, am I racist? But start asking, do I have racist moments? So let me give you an example. I was watching TV one day and I was watching Andy Griffith and my husband came in the room and he was like, oh, is that the one with the lady doctor? And I was like, lady doctor? I was like, first of all, are you a hundred? Like, what do you mean? <laughs> And, you know, he's a physician and he's worked with women for decades, you know? So I was like, that's pretty sexist. And as soon as I said that, he was like, yeah, that was sexist. Like, why did I say that? It's like, it just kind of blurted out. It just kind of came out. He didn't know where it came from, but it's, you know, probably some of that male supremacist kind of conditioning that most of us have. That's why they asked that riddle. I'm sure most of you heard the riddle about, you know, the man and his son are in an accident and then they're, um, they're horribly hurt and they're rolling the son into the operating room and the doctor says, I can't work on this child. He's my son. You know, who is it? And it's the mother. But the reason why it's even a thing is because we're t we tend to be programmed to think of men um, or think of doctors, surgeons as men, just as other uh, people in positions of high authority. Does it mean they're a horrible person? Does it mean he's overtly working against women or doesn't believe in equality? Um, but he had a sexist moment. Just like with me, there have been times when I did something and then I thought about it afterwards. Like one time I get pitches all the time because I write and this one guy pitched me and he was really a marketing person. But in his pitch, he noted several like celebrities, like rappers, um, obviously people from the black community, uh, well known. And because he noted them as his clients, for some reason, I automatically was thinking, oh, well, you should reach out to the DNI lane. You should reach out to diversity and inclusion. And then later, and it wasn't even immediately, later, it must have been a couple hours later, I, I caught myself. I said, wait a minute. Was I sent him to DNI? I said, let me go back to his pitch. I reread his pitch. I went to his website, and he's just a marketing person, just like any marketing person. He just so happened to have a few clients who were rappers. But in my mind, as soon as I saw those names, I immediately went to diversity and inclusion. Hmm. And so I was like, you know, I really had a racist moment because as soon as I saw that association, I stopped thinking of him as just like a marketing expert and automatically put him into the DNI lane. Hmm. So what are your thoughts on that in terms of being racist versus having a racist moment? Um, well, that leads right up to my, my beef with D'Angelo is that I don't think that First of all, white people, just like black people or any group of, you know, any race is not a monolith. So there's no way that you can talk about all blacks, all whites, which in her book she does. And she doesn't differentiate between American and, you know, whites around the world. But her main point is that whites are inherently racist because white people are born racist because we're born into a racialized society. And I believe in, obviously, I mean, it's not even a belief, like we are, we're born into a racialized society. We have a very racialized society with a very dark past that's still going today. That's all true. The inherent part is where I really diverge from, from her whole thesis is that we're, it, we're, it's not hopeless for white people, but if you read her book, and this is in her last chapter, she says, white identity is inherently racist. White people do not exist outside the system of white supremacy. But if you compare that to what Kendi says, it is more about, you know, it's not an exclusive sport racism. Anyone can do it. And it isn't a permanent label. It's something that you, it's a behavior, it's an attitude, it's a learned uh, behavior. And um, so it's not inescapable. And I feel like D'Angelo paints this very bleak evangelical picture of, you know, if you're white, you're a hope. Um, and the best you can do is be a repentant racist. And what happens, at least for me, and I went through this after I read her book, 
and I think a lot of white progressive liberal women are reading only this book. Um, I went through this period of guilt and shame and horror and 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 despair, thinking like there's nothing I can do because I'm always going to be white. And then I finally got to the point speaking to you where you said, you know, you don't have to glom on to any one philosophy here. It's just one more angle. And she does give you very good food for thought. Like her book is not entirely, you know, lost. It's just that I think her conclusion is a very circular argument that doesn't provide a way forward other than to say, and I quote, be less white. And I think a lot of people read that and go, well, how? Like, what am I supposed to, it's just the most vague solution to the problem. So I think that it is more about if we all share this racialized society, we are all capable of having racist moments. That's not to say that racism has not been institutionalized and targeted disproportionately toward people of color, it has. But we're all capable, because we have implicit bias, of having those racist moments. Sure, sure. So again, there's a lot there. So let's unpack that. And I really want to encourage you guys. I want you to comment. I want you to let us know what your thoughts are. Um, again, we're open. All thoughts and opinions. Um, let us know. But first, to get this out of the way, this concept of she can't speak for all white people, you know, just like I can't speak for all black people. I get that. And I'm pretty sure she acknowledges that. I mean, no one person can speak for an entire race, just like I can't. But to an extent, if we use that as a barometer and say, or it, uh, it nullifies her, if we use that as a barometer, then that means that we would never listen to anybody because there's nobody who can speak for everybody. So, you know, I kind of want to put that to the side for a second. But this whole issue about all white people being, and I'm so cautious about the words because it sounds, sounds like such a um, provocative statement. I think when I remember reading the book, um, I didn't get that sense. The sense that I got from her was that she was saying, anyone who's grown up in this culture, there's no way that you're going to escape the mm -hmm. Uh, implicit bias that the imprint on your brain that's always telling you it's better to be male to be white to be thin to be pretty I mean that's just the culture that we've been indoctrinated in and so there's no way to kind of escape that no matter how much you might think you are or want yourself to be that's why I, I went and took the implicit association test because neurologically they're testing the associations that you're making. And if you want to learn more about that, read Blind Spot. It's an amazing, it's written by these Harvard psychologists. It's really, really amazing to look at the evolution. They actually started with looking at people's association with uh, butterflies and insects with positive words and negative words. So it's really, really scientific and interesting. So in my mind, I don't think that she's saying there's something like biological, like there's something inherent about white people. I think that what she's speaking to is the indoctrination in this society. There's really no way to escape that much like, I'm not sure if I shared this last time or not, an analogy that I use sometimes with groups is say, if you moved to Paris and you didn't want to, and you hated French and French culture and you lived there for five years, there's no way you're going to live. You're going to be immersed in that right. and not, up some language. It is just going to happen whether you want it or not. Right. I think, so I think Glennon Doyle, who's the other white woman whisperer on the subject of racism is, I think she put it a little more kind of in friendlier terms, I guess, when she said, you know, it's not a personal moral failing if you harbor racist attitudes, beliefs, thoughts, whatever, because it's like pollution. It's like if you live in the city, you're breathing that air. We're all breathing it. That doesn't mean it's your fault per se. I mean, you drive a car so you contribute, but it's more about like getting away from the shame and the guilt. And I'm always going to be racist because I'm white. And I do feel like she, Robin D'Angelo uses the word white as an adjective in so many places in her book that it is such a, a condemnation of whiteness. And I think that's kind of what we're trying to get away from is dividing people by color and making people feel that you're 
guilty from the get-go and that becoming unracist is about as likely as becoming non-white, which none of us can do. So I feel like she just presents you with this horrible dead end and it's very damning. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's useful because she does show all the angles of how racism shows up in our lives, in our personal thoughts and feelings. And that's useful. I just think her solution of strive to be less white, which is a direct quote from her last chapter, it does have an air of, of, you know, self guilt and I need to be saved and I need to figure out how to deal with this, you know, anxiety yeah. that I'm not perfect. And I think it speaks more to the obsession with perfection in the, in white America progressive liberal circles than it does to the existence of this inherent racism that she's talking about. Right. Well, a few things there. One, when I look at her comments about whiteness um, relative to racism, I don't think it's out of a desire to beat white people over the head and make them feel bad and make them feel like they're all horrible. And because again, that's why she talks about the good, bad binary. She's saying it's not an issue of goodness or badness, mm -hmm. but I think it come. And again, I can't speak for her. So let me say that as well. Um, but the way I processed it and read it was no one can fix a problem that they don't first acknowledge. And as long as we go around, particularly as white progressives, as long as they go around and say, oh, racism is so horrible. Oh, yes, I voted for Obama and I gave this money and I have a black friend and my daughter's dating a black guy and I'm OK with it. And I just made him sweet tea the other day that then we assume that everybody else is the problem. Mm -hmm. If everybody thinks somebody else is the problem, then the problem's never going to get fixed. That's so true. I think what she's saying is. I could write a 5,000 page book. The first step needs to be acknowledging and identifying and understanding the problem. Right. So that's why I think she puts so much energy into that. There, there's a reason why the first step of the 12 steps is acknowledging that there is a problem. Because right. if you don't acknowledge the problem, you will never fix it. So okay. I don't perceive it as her saying white people are a foregone conclusion because if, if that was the case, then why does she talk about repair skills? She talks extensively about repair skills. She gives an example about something that she said in a situation and how she repaired it. And I'm assuming she's doing that as a model. She's talking about the importance of repairing. But right. I think that what she's saying is you have to first have the awareness if you don't have the awareness, then you're sitting there wagging your finger, patting yourself on the back for voting for Obama, mm -hmm. but you might be in a work situation that hasn't promoted a black person in the past five years, yeah. or you have direct responsibility over a supplier management, but um, you're, use, you're using the same good old boy suppliers that you've used for the past 10 years and there's very little diversity. Yeah. Um, so you're continuing to perpetuate the racism because you don't see it within yourself. Right. I feel like she's really good at creating a sense of there is a problem and she's pretty good at showing, you know, the detailed ways that it shows up. I think the, the effect of her words though can sometimes feel like a doctor saying, you have terminal cancer. I'm not going to tell you where it is or what it is or how long you have to live, but good luck, you know? And then she's the person that has the magic $40,000 diversity training pill that might help you live a little longer, but you're, you're screwed, you know? So to me, that's a dark outlook. And she says, and I quote that white people are unified in their hate for blackness. I just don't go there. Yes, she say that? I don't. I, she Where said it. Where is it? Show me the book. Pick up the book. Pick up the book. <laughs> okay. I mean, you don't have you don't have to, but I don't I don't remember I don't remember reading that because I I do think that a lot of her stuff is very misappropriated. I absolutely do. I was telling Vanessa before we came on somebody. Um, reached out to me on on social media and was just ripping me and talking about how I wrote some article, blah, 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 and said white people are horrible. I was like, okay, send me a link to the article. I so then they said, well, actually, you didn't write it. But 
um, I was at a training for Dr. Robin D'Angelo and she said, and I'm like, well, I don't speak for her. I speak for me. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like, it's every time I you know, kept coming back with truth, they kept backtracking because I think sometimes people also hear what they want to hear. Right. They hear something that makes them start to feel uncomfortable. And yeah. so now I can't accept that. So I'm going to make this person out to be, you know, some horrible, you know, crazy person. Right. So I, I personally think that a lot of her messaging is misappropriated. It's taken out of context. Um, it's misconstrued. But but so repeat it again. What is it you said that she said? She says that white people are unified in their hate of blackness. Um, and, you know, and then she. she yeah, wait, 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 wait. Let's diagnose that for a second. So she didn't say unified in their hate of black people. Blackness. Yeah. She said blackness. Right. Now, think, sit with that for a second. White people are unified in their hate of blackness. Hate of blackness. What do you think that is? Think about the history of this country. I, and do you see yeah. any truth in a hate of blackness? And I wouldn't necessarily... <laughs> What, what did the doll? What did the doll test prove in fifty four? I mean, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, no, but no, it's real. Like that's the that's the funny thing about her book is that it is, I would say, ninety eight percent legit. Like she's dropping some truth here that's really hard to swallow, and that part needs to be swallowed and sat with, and it is sobering for a reason, and it is uncomfortable to read for a reason because there's a lot in there that no one's been brave enough to say before that white people really need to hear and sit with. And so it has a lot of value in that respect. What I think a lot of people are talking about the biggest problem being is not the racist, you know, in the deep South doing all of the traditional racist things that we think of as the only people in this country who are racist. It's the moderate liberals who are honestly oblivious more than they are unified by hate. You know, right, right. No. And again, when I think of a hate of blackness mm -hmm. and I think of this country and it's so interesting, the next person I'm going to have on is my college roommate who's in the media entertainment industry. And we're going to talk about the images and the imagery and how we are um, inundated with images telling us that white is good <laughs> and black is bad. That's why we yeah. have the term white list. And blacklist. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when she talks about a hate of blackness, um, to me that I think that our conditioning, I, I can see certainly why she would say that is that growing up in a culture that continuously inundates you with the sense that white is better, black is bad. That's the whole concept behind caste. That was the whole concept behind the doll test in the 50s, which is how Brown, well, you know, one of the factors, the contributing factors for Brown versus Board of Education. They showed that white children didn't just prefer the white dolls. The black children preferred the white dolls because mm -hmm. the subliminal messaging is white is better. When you right. look at those psychological tests that they give to the kids, they don't just ask who's prettier. They say, who's better? Mm -hmm. Who's smarter? Who's nicer? Mm -hmm. Because the concept is white is good and black is bad. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that D'Angelo calls out, which I'm so appreciative of, is saying, hey, yes, racism is pervasive, but there's something that's particularly anti-black mm -hmm. about our country. Right. Um, so I would just encourage you to maybe consider that through a different lens. And I think, I mean, I, the funny thing is, I, I agree with, the basic premise of her book, I think the delivery though can get lost in translation a little too easily because she's a bit aggressive in her approach. And, and if she could hear me saying this, she would just love it because she'd say, well, that's your white fragility talking. But I'm just wary of any thesis, which her book is. She doesn't back up a lot of her arguments with, you know, hardcore evidence. It's a lot of anecdotal stories. But there's a lot of truth in there. It's not, you know, just a bunch of crap. There's a lot of truth. But at the end of the day, I feel like she's just trying to paint this very hopeless picture, which is not helpful for moving things forward, in my opinion. Okay. So I subtitled this Discussing the Undiscussables, real and it's obviously real talk about race. So we're going to get into some, some real talk right now. So brace yourself, okay? <laughs> um, so Vanessa, 
Let me tell you, I'm going to be more honest with you than most people would be. Let me tell you how what you're saying is landing to me. And this is the same frustration I have with Bill Maher. Um, what I'm hearing you say is 98% of what she says, I agree with, and I think is perfectly legitimate. But there's a 2%, the wording in there, it's like she didn't put the comma here, she put the comma here. Mm -hmm. Or she didn't where to use this version of the word. And that makes me feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And because it makes me feel uncomfortable and defensiveness, I'm going to lean mm -hmm. into that. I'm going to focus in on the defensiveness and my lack of comfort. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm going to focus on. That's the way it kind of feels to me. And that's the way it kind of lands to me. Because I bet, I mean, I guess you can't see my books here. I could pull off probably any of those books back there, mm -hmm. I, that I agree with 100% of any of them. I wrote a book. I don't know if I agree with 100% of what I might have written 10, 20, 30 years ago. So my question is, why is there the obsession? Because this also reminds me of, I remember Ta-Nehisi Coates being um, interviewed one time and they were trying to pick apart, someone was trying to pick apart something he had written. They basically said, well, you focus so much on this. Why didn't you talk about that? He's like, because I didn't. It's like if I wrote a book on Georgia and then someone say, well, why didn't you talk about Mississippi? Mm -hmm. Because I didn't like somebody else will write that book. So my point also, when I'm thinking about some of what Robin D'Angelo talked about, there's a lot that she didn't talk about. When you talk about the, the other side of it in terms of what are active steps that people can take or mm -hmm. how do you fix this? I personally feel like a lot of her book is dedicated to getting white people to better understand and acknowledge how they can be a barrier to advancing anti-racism unwittingly without right. realizing it. And I think that's huge. Yeah. If she can make headway with that, right. that is so huge. So to now say, oh, okay, yeah, this is a big issue and you did such an exemplary job. There are very few white people who've been bold and brave enough to tackle this. And mm -hmm. But you didn't give me like a, a long prescription of everything that I need to do yeah. to, to counter it. In some ways, I'm like, well, maybe that wasn't the focus of her book. And right. why does she have to talk about that? Well, I don't feel like she's you know left me without a prescription. I feel like maybe unwittingly she's created a huge barrier for the people who are reading this book because whether she, you know, foresaw it or not, this has been the go-to book for white liberal women in particular. And I think there's already this, you know, I mean, in American society, we have very deep Christian evangelical roots. Like even those of us who weren't raised religious, you know, but I was, I was raised in the Mormon church and, what I went through after I read this book was just this paralyzing sense of shame, guilt, and hopelessness. And I stayed there for months. And I don't think there's anything wrong with feeling the gravity of the situation and coming to grips with the fact that like, yeah, there's been this hideous reality right under your nose for your whole life that you've conveniently been able to just ignore. You knew about it, but you didn't really pay attention. Like I get that it is like cold water to the face and we need that. That's the value of that book, I think. But for me, that was sort of an entree into shaping my own view of what this conversation is big picture. And for me, it's not hopelessness and despair and shame and guilt because then what I started doing, and I think a lot of people do after they read her book, is I start looking for salvation. I'm looking for anyone to tell me like, it's gonna be okay. And if you do these things, then you will at least absolve some part of your hopeless racism, and that should be enough. And I don't, that doesn't resonate with me. I think there should be remorse and there should be reflection and there should be an ongoing, you know, check of any racist behavior, thoughts, whatever that come up, but that the overarching goal should be a positive one. And it should be about moving forward together and understanding that, you know, our struggles are connected as a human family and that, if we can lift people up and move forward together, there's so much more power in that than focusing on our own imperfections that we can't even really articulate for ourselves. I don't know if we need to spend so much time there. A little bit of time is helpful, but I think 
not to you know sit on that lily pad forever. And I think a lot of people are getting stuck on that lily pad because she says, if any part of this bothers you, it's because you're racist. So you have to get to a point where you're like, okay, I am racist. I accept that. I will wear that label. I'm not personally as afraid of that as I used to be. Now it's like, okay, I have that. So where do I go with it? Yeah. And again, I'm just going to repeat it because it's so important. I don't want anybody taking on labels. You know, I don't think labels are important, but I think we all have to acknowledge how we can be part of the solution. The, the yeah. truth is none of us are perfect. We all have bias um, and, you know, it could be gender, it could be race, it, it could be lots of different things. So again, I'll just repeat, as long as we assume that everybody else is the problem and we're perfect, we're not going to move forward. Right. So I don't think it's about anybody carrying some label and all white people are race. I don't think it's about that. I think it's about creating greater awareness so we can see how we're not just part of the problem, how we can also be part of the solution. And my... Again, I'm not Robin D'Angelo. I don't have any relationship with Robin D'Angelo. But my assumption is Robin D'Angelo wants white people to read that book and then read 30 more books or go out and take action or do things. The problem is when you talk about getting stuck there is when you just focus on that. You zero mm -hmm. in on, oh, she called me racist. And mm -hmm. it's like the five stages of grief. If right. you get stuck there or I, as a, a trainer, I talk about five stages of change management and grief. Mm -hmm is one of those stages, but you can't get stuck there. Right. You've got to keep going and you've got right. to figure out, yes, understanding the problem, it's like in a marriage. If you realize you've got a problem or there was a lie or a cheat or something, we've got to deal with it, yeah. but then we've got to repair. We've got to figure out what does that mean for us mm -hmm. and how do we move forward? And right. then a big part of what you talked about and you and I have talked um, offline, all this last week and I think the week before is I think that it's so easy to fall into the trap of trying to find your solution in one book. Mm -hmm. And that's not the way this works. I mean, racism is a you know very fluid, dynamic, deep, rich, nuanced issue. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we go to books to get information and support um, and knowledge. But ultimately, we still have accountability mm -hmm. for deciding how we are going to live our lives, how we're going to combat racism, where we work, where we live. And the analogy right. I gave Vanessa was, there's not one parenting book. There's not one diet book. Mm -hmm. There's 500 diet books, because guess what? It's a deep, rich issue. There are lots of things that work. You've got to figure out what is the best fit for you. And you can't put that responsibility onto D'Angelo or Kendi or, or anybody. Mm -hmm. You got to consult that because I think, and Vanessa chime in, tell me, you know, keep me honest. Vanessa will read something and then she'll email me and say, I don't agree with this person, or she'll read another <laughs> article. If this is what anti racism is, I don't, you know, I mean, yeah. it's not that, but she'll get real fired up. And I just, and any, I mean, I expect to disagree with half the stuff I read. So it doesn't, mm -hmm. that doesn't bother me at all. I'm still, my focus. I'm not giving that agency over to anybody. I don't care how many PhDs you have behind your name. I still have the responsibility for defining my value system and right. deciding how I'm going to live my values in my life. So I think it's a fallacy to think you're going to pick any book off the shelf and think that that's going to now become your prescription for right. what anti-racism is, what it should mean to you and how it's gonna manifest in your life. Well, that's one more thing I have with D'Angelo is that you, know, you do have to go back to your own set of critical thinking as with any ism that you're studying. It doesn't, you know, it's not just reading the Bible of Kendi or the Bible of D'Angelo and that is the end all be all truth. Like you have to check that with what feels true to you and what you know. What I feel like D'Angelo does, though, is she strips you of any sense of being able to trust your own instincts. And I think that that's problematic. She so. strips you of, well, how so? Well, she'll say things like, you know, here's all the predictable responses that I see from white people in my diversity trainings. These are the things that come up. And again, it's useful because a lot of white people will read this book and recognize themselves on the page. And that is a very important learning moment to be like, yeah, that is exactly what I wanted to say the first time someone suggested I might 
be racist or have racist tendencies. That was my first excuse that popped up. Or I do feel defensive just reading this book. Like though that's all real stuff that someone needed to say out loud to white people. So to her for full credit, like that is important and it's useful. I just think that separating someone, telling someone you have this inherent issue and it's probably hard for you to see because you're so steeped in it that it's going to be hard for you to even eradicate it from yourself. And so don't even try because it's inherent to me is such a disempowering message. And I like when in Doyle and Kendi's approach so much more where it's like, let's declinify this whole thing, take the paranoid aspects out of it and rehumanize the subject. Um, and talk to each other as people, because even her example of how she does the repair work sounds so stilted and awkward. Like if someone came up to me and was like, will you grant me the opportunity to apologize? <laughs> it's like, I'd be like, are, who are you? Are you Shakespeare? Like, just talk to me, you know? And as if I were a black person, I just feel like that would racialize me even more. And I would want someone to just come up to me and say like, look, I screwed up. I said something dumb. Can we talk about it? Like you would to anybody else, you know? So her, approach is just so evangelical like she just reminds me of a very devout that she has like racial piety or something you know right, right. And that doesn't jive with me but it she has a very valuable message like i can't say that enough she has a very valuable message right right well you know i think it's almost like anything else i mean her book has sold millions and millions of copies it's you know struck a chord with a lot of people she said things that i think personally really absolutely needs to be need to be said no. i don't think she would have written the book if she thought there was no hope and she thought that there was no point in it um i think she probably wrote the book because she um felt almost exactly the opposite but she felt that this issue of white fragility was such a barrier mm -hmm. and it's something that um probably only well, I shouldn't say, but probably she's better positioned to talk about or to talk mm -hmm. to white people about. Can you imagine if a black person <laughs> had been saying that to you? I, I could imagine how what your reaction what your reaction would have been then. Right. But right. does that mean that her tone and her style have to be everyone's cup of tea? Absolutely not. In fact, I say that in my LinkedIn learning course. You can speak up. The course is how to speak up against racism at work. You can speak up in your own way, your own style. It might not be my style. It might not be my wording. That's fine. You don't have to mimic me, but mm -hmm. do it in a way that's most comfortable for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I don't think anyone wanted, I don't think she would ever want her book to be the, the only book, the Bible. She probably wants you to put her book down and read 30 more books. And then you develop your own style, your own approach. But no. again, I you just have different expectations. I don't I don't ever expect to read something and feel like, oh, that's exactly the way I would do it, you know, <laughs> or that's exactly the way I would word it. No, I'm yeah. going to take, you know, I would say pick the parts that work for you or salient for you and helpful for you yeah. and skip the rest and move on to another book. Right. She wouldn't allow that, just so you know. She no. <laughs> No, no. I mean, again, I, I personally think D'Angelo gets a really, really um, bad rap. And in a way, I can kind of relate to it because she's blunt and I'm blunt. And yeah. um, so for me, a lot of what she said landed uh, well. But again, a lot of her audience was was more so was more so white people. Yeah. So I cannot believe we're coming up on 44 minutes. I, I promised myself I was trying to keep these shorter. So with that, we'll absolutely have to have Vanessa on again um, if, if she'll come back. You have an open invitation, Vanessa. Anytime you've got time available during our time slot, I would love to continue this conversation. And I really want to encourage everybody, um, please, please, uh, let us know what your questions are. Message me on LinkedIn. Let me know show topic ideas, things you like, things you don't like. Please, please message me on LinkedIn. Let me know all that good stuff. As we close, because we focus so much on um, the black-white dynamic and anti-black racism, I really do want to, to call out the racism being perpetuated, the racism that's in the news, in particular over the past several weeks against Asians. You know, and it's just an example of how horrible and insidious 
racism is. It doesn't just impact black people. Um, it impacts all different uh, people of color and people from different ethnicities. So it's, it's horrible. And I really, really want to stand in solidarity with my Asian brothers and sisters. So with that, I want to thank Vanessa for coming on again. And I want to invite you guys again to just join us every first and third Tuesday, same time, noon, where we're going to be having real talk about race. I alluded to it earlier. My next planned guest is my college roommate. So you're really going to be hearing some real talk. She also happens to be a full-time actress. She's acted on lots of shows you guys would know. Um, uh, Walking Dead. Uh, I hear people watch that one. <laughs> I don't actually watch that one. Stranger Things. Um, she's been in some movies. She's been in a lot of interesting things. So we're going to have a interesting conversation. And we're also going to talk about racism in the media and racism in the entertainment space and what impact it has on all of us. So I want to thank you guys for joining us. Join us next time. Bye-bye. Bye.